nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. What I'm going to do tonight over the next sort of 30 to 35 minutes is give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on in the world of digital marketing. Now, of course, you know, to cover everything that's going on in digital marketing in 35 minutes is kind of an impossible challenge. Uh, so what I want to do is really share with you some principles that I think are really key and to illustrate those principles through some work that I've been doing actually with Wharton Startup. So I think that's one of the nice things that Sam kind of alluded to. We have a very good bond between the faculty uh, and the alumni that come through the program. In fact, one of the startups I'm going to talk about tonight is an LA-based startup. Uh, Co-founder Tom is here in the audience. Maybe he'll make himself uh, known, Tom Bellamacy. Uh, you may have seen Tom in his TV debut the other day on KT <laughs> KTLA. If you haven't, I'm going to show you. And uh, I was actually... <laughs> It was actually at an event very similar to this two years ago uh, where I was sharing some research that I'd been doing around uh, internet retailing and also some research that my colleague Josh Leischberg had been doing in the area of media uh, and entertainment. It was an event at a different hotel in Los Angeles. Tom and I reconnected. Uh, I actually became part of the, uh, the team at Pop-Up Pantry in terms of doing a little bit of investing and advising and also working with some of the other startups in terms of really analyzing the research because I think that's one thing that we really care about at Wharton is kind of Wharton knowledge for action that we're trying to come up with things that you guys can actually use. So I'm going to enjoy sharing that with you. OK, so um, this was kind of the blurb that you read or maybe didn't read okay, that brought you along here. Three main assets that we have as marketers are the following. Number one, the brand, like the Wharton brand, like the Google brand, like the Coca-Cola brand, the Goldman Sachs brand. So that's the most important intangible asset that you have. Uh, a study that was done in the Wall Street Journal or reported in the Wall Street Journal said brands account for about one third of all of the value held globally in the various stock markets around the world. If you read Jeremy Siegel's book, uh, Stocks for the Long Run, uh, Jeremy went back to 1953 and he took all of the stocks that were on the New York Exchange, he ran them all forward 50 years. It turned out 17 of the 20 top performers were globally known uh, strong brands. So there's a financial kind of tie in there too. Uh, the second thing that's really key in marketing is the customer asset. So how do you engage, how do you attract, and how do you retain customers? The old source is, you know, five times more expensive to get a new customer than it is to sort of keep an existing one happy. The way that transpires in digital marketing is even more interesting because your existing customers that are happy are the best source that you can have of new customers going forward. So when I was doing work with diapers.com, publishing some research and doing some other things there, we found that the top 100 customers out of the first uh, 100,000 through the gate. And you may have heard about the sort of story of diapers.com. It was a colleague from Wharton, San Francisco, and his high school friend, uh, Mark and Vineet. Uh, you know, Mark and his wife have a baby. He realizes going to Safeway is a pain in the neck. Diapers are expensive. It's inconvenient. The product that you often want is not there. So he starts diapers.com, 2005, 2011, sold to Amazon for $545 million. And what we found was the top 100 customers generated through their family tree about 15,000 other customers. So that's something sort of very new. So those are the principles that we want to get to. Um, this is roughly where we're going to go over the next half an hour. So I'm going to try and motivate the topic a little bit, give you a little bit of data that hopefully you'll find interesting. We'll then get into the assets, and then I'll talk about asset building through uh, three companies. Uh, and I was going to sort of do the full thing. I was going to eat a pop-up pantry meal whilst wearing my Warby Parker sunglasses and, you know, turning around with my bonobos pants. But somehow only the pants actually made it here. So there's no food and no sunglasses. But those are the three companies um, that I'm going to talk about, how they use digital marketing to build their, uh, their brand and customer assets. So um, before we get into this, I'm just going to, you know, when we get to the end, we're going to have at least, I hope, 15 or 20 minutes to really kind of talk together and do some Q&A. And, and as Sam, I think, very nicely said, uh, this is a short session physically where we're together, but obviously we can continue to connect. Uh, I'm going to be teaching a course on this material in San Francisco in October and also next year in the spring. So I've already pinged Tom as a, as a guest speaker. Okay? So I'm going to show you guys um, this video. And I just want you to think about how this video is different from the TV advertisement that you might have seen for the same company perhaps 15 to 20 years ago.
Okay, so uh, I saw Paul Chung. So Paul Chung is a good friend of mine. He and I used to play on the rugby team together, so I can't see him because of the lights. But where's Paul Chung? I'm going to ask Paul, what's one thing that's kind of different, um, you know, compared to watching a, a Coke ad on TV 20 years ago? Uh, yeah, it's a lot longer, right? You're not constrained by a 30-second spot. So you guys may generate things other than what I've got here, but what, what else? Good, yeah. What else? Yeah, it looks like reality TV, so it's kind of, you know, it, uh, people consuming Coke as part of their daily life, right? Product and use, yeah, what else? It's like community experience. Yeah, I love it. Sorry, what's the name? Jake. Jake, okay, good. I don't think, Jake, you weren't in my class, right? No. No, you must have had some better professor, because that's a great answer. <laughs> okay, so good, it's really great. So what Jake is saying is about a community, right? So consumption now is, is really about communities as much as it is about individuals. So that's a very important point. What else? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that was community. Yeah. Yeah, let's come back to that at the end. A couple others. Yeah, I don't want to push it off. Yeah. Please, at the back, Brett. There's no polar bears. Uh, there's no polar bears. Yeah, okay. Last one, yeah. Well, just the, uh, again, back to the reality, I think the reaction was multiple perspectives, very rough cut, uh, in, as if it were a camera person's team situation in a lot of situations. Right, okay, so certainly in terms of the execution, you know, we're in Los Angeles, so a lot of you guys obviously are thinking about the creative execution, okay, which is important. But what's interesting here, if we look at the definition, digital marketing is the use of the internet connected devices to engage a customer, okay? But at the end of the day, it's still marketing. So it's very important to still be going after the right customer in the right circumstance with the right message and so on. So it's still marketing, it's still the five C's and the four P's. And if you look at that ad, um, there's at least three themes that I think are really important. So again, in the spirit of not being able to get into all of the weeds of every possible method that we could use in terms of a digital marketing tool, what are three kind of pillars that digital marketing gives us that traditional marketing did not? Okay, now I, I do want to come back to the Coke question, but the first thing that Jake said, right, is it's inherently social. So it's giving us another venue for selling and engaging customers that's interactive, that's about dialogue and richness that we didn't have before. That was clearly in the video. If we looked at the bottom of the video, I think it's been watched about 4.9 million times. The last time I watched it, it only been watched maybe three and a half. So it just it keeps going as people keep sharing it. The second thing I think is really key about digital marketing, many of you in the room for sure are doing this, is now you know a lot about what people are actually doing. So the old saw from John Wanamaker, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted, I don't know which half, is really starting to go away because you can optimize through digital advertising and behavioral targeting. So, you know, if I go to the website Rugby Heaven, what pops up there is an ad for Bonobos Pants. Why does it pop up? Because they know that I've visited the Bonobos website in the past. They know that on Facebook, some of my other friends have bought Bonobos. So it's using very, very rich information about the individual to optimize. And then the third thing that I think is really key in digital marketing is digital marketing gives you a chance to experiment and A-B test and learn in a way that we couldn't do it before. So we could have shown that ad with instead of a Subway sandwich, maybe we show it with um, <clears throat> Kentucky Fried Chicken. Maybe we show a different colored vending machine. So all kinds of experimentation is possible. And I'm sure when we get to the discussion, maybe you guys can generate some examples on that. Um, the third, uh, sorry, the fourth thing down the bottom here is something that I'm particularly passionate about, that I think is really key in digital marketing, um, is that people still live in the real world. And one thing I find repeatedly, I'm gonna talk about Pop-Up Pantry, Bonobos, and Warby Parker, is that action that takes place in the real world, the amplification of that action through marketing into the virtual world creates an incredible power to what's going on. So when Warby Parker, for example, knows that Jack Kerouac, so that's the, I always mess up his name, but he's that American writer that wrote the book, um, On the Road, you know who I'm talking about. Okay. Now you might think I was educated in Australia, but you know, I actually went to school in New Zealand. But, um, so Jack Kerouac, um, the book on the road, uh, the characters' names, Warby Parker, are coming from an, un from an unpublished novel. So when there was an exhibition of the author's work at the New York Public Library, what happened was Warby Parker models went in and sat down in the library as a flash mob, and they were wearing the glasses, and they held up books, and on the spine of the book was the name of the frame. So when you do something like that in the real world, the way that gets amplified through PR and through blogging and everything else is very, very powerful. So uh, I'll talk about that if we have time towards the end. Okay, just some basic sort of statistics that I think are really fascinating. So social commerce, as Jake said, it's about reviews, it's about blogs, curation, it's about the strength of weak ties. There's a famous paper written in 1973 by a Stanford professor. Uh, it's basically the idea of trusting people that you don't really know that are one or two degrees away from you. 
And the reason you trust them is because they bring additional information uh, to bear that you wouldn't have gotten through your own kind of social network. So this trusting of strangers is kind of an interesting thing that goes on. Um, if you look at digital advertising behavioral targeting, you know, about five trillion ads are getting served. The cookie trail's becoming more and more complex. You've got demand side platforms, supply side platforms simultaneously optimizing stuff. So that's obviously very exciting. And then if you look at the experimentation that's going on, um, if you're interested, there's a very good paper written by a friend of mine from New Zealand who teaches now at Sloan. Uh, just came out in the Harvard Business Review. There was more data collected in 2011 than in all of the prior years before that. So think about your ability to kind of test in this environment. So it's never been easier to get started, but maybe also it's never been easier to kind of mess things up. So let's go on. Um, what are our goals then in this new environment, digital marketing? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? So I would argue that essentially, uh, we're still trying to accomplish the same things, we're just using different ways of getting there. So what are you trying to accomplish with a brand? Essentially a brand is all about trying to affect somebody's heart. How do they feel about you? Do they feel good when they go to the pop-up pantry website and they learn about the, you know, the nice food that's grown in California and they see a picture of uh, Tom's dog and so forth? Um, you sometimes try and change the way they think. You know, what's their attitude towards the product or service? So, Years ago, I think in the United States as well as in New Zealand, when there was kind of an anti-red meat thing going on, because it was found not to be particularly health, healthful, um, who came along but pork and said, well, pork, that's the other white meat. It was already in your brain that white is good for you, so they wanted to get onto the white meat side and thereby stimulated a lot of additional sales. So often it's about changing the way you think, and sometimes it's about getting people to take an action. So that really hasn't changed. You're still trying to do that, and we'll see this through example. With the customer, it's really the same thing. Um, you're trying to convert people from knowing about you to trying you to using you on a repeated basis and then hopefully generating value over the long term and also what's different, telling other people and bringing them into the fold as well. Okay, so those are the goals. Um, how do we go about doing this just generally and then let's look at the differences that get layered in digital marketing. So this is kind of a fairly standard hierarchy of what we do when we build brands. Um, so the first thing we do is we have to come up with a name. Warby Parker, Bonobos. Do you, do you guys know these brands, by the way? You will when I show you the site if you haven't already. Bonobos, Pop-Up Pantry. So a brand is a name, term, sign, symbol, or design intended to differentiate the goods of one seller from another. That's what the American Marketing Association would tell us. That hasn't really changed, but our ability to build brands now is very, very different, as we'll see in a second. Um, the second thing that I've kind of bolded here, because this is the next step in building a brand, I think this is now particularly important in digital marketing, is a brand is really a signal of unobserved product quality. I don't really know if the water that I'm drinking was just filled out of the tap or not, but somehow because of the nice label and everything that's going along with it, I kind of trust that it came from a spring in Fiji. So what you're doing with a brand is you're trying to signal things that customers can't verify for themselves, and in the digital space, this becomes particularly important. Number three, you're trying to build a reputation. This is just doing number two over time. Number four, you're trying to build associations and memory. So when I think of Virgin, Virgin Atlantic, I think of Richard Branson, I think of fun, I think of being British, I think of being a bit irreverent, I think of being an upstart. Okay, so you're building those associations. And then number five, sort of the holy grail, uh, which I think, again, is even more important in the digital space, and I'll explain why, is a brand is also a social marker. When you wear you know, bonobo's pants, you're saying something about yourself. When you're driving a Lexus and not a BMW, you're expressing something about your personality. So what you're doing with a brand as a social marker is you're saying something about who you want to be associated with. And what's really interesting in the, business, in the digital space is the brand that's getting bought is not just the thing that's getting eaten or used or consumed, it's also the people behind it. That's very, very different in the digital space. You know, Tom is tweeting directly with his customers. You know, Andy Dunn, the CEO of Bonobos, is interacting directly with the customers. When Warby Parker publishes their annual report, they show things like how many males and females work there, how much coffee gets drunk, that the average commute is like 60 miles. Because what people are buying in the brand is not just this, it's the whole ecosystem. So that's a very, very important change. Okay, so that's where we're going with brands. Um, customers, I think, are pretty straightforward but with one change. Just like in branding, there was some changing to the principles, there's a change here as well. So what are you trying to do with customers? You're trying to acquire them, engage them, retain them, 
and you're trying not to break two rules. So maxim number one, which seems very obvious, but people break it all the time, you never want to pay more to acquire a customer than you can hope to get back in return. That's the difference between pets.com okay, and wag.com. Okay? Wag.com is a sister company of diapers.com. Right? And then maximum number two, which is really interesting, and this is particularly important in the digital space. Do you guys all know, I'm not going to ask Paul again, but you know what CLV is? I guess we all, customer lifetime value. But you know what's really important in the internet space is also RLV, the referral lifetime value. So let me take um, the lady in the front. What's your name, please? Sorry, I can't. I, normally my eyesight's good, but the text. Jacqueline. So, so imagine Jacqueline is not buying a lot of product from pop-up pantry, let's say. She only buys once every six months, but she's a very social person, and she introduces a lot of other people into the company. And so how is it that in the digital marketing world, you can capture the referral lifetime value as well as the customer lifetime value? People are working on it. No one's come up with a simple formula, but it's a really critical thing to think about. OK, so those are our principles. Uh, let's now go and look at um, three great brands uh, and great acquire of customers and see how they do it. I'll give a little bit of the story. So for those of you who don't know, when I pull up the website, warbyparker.com, is, this is very timely too. It's not just that we're all in LA, the greatest city in America. Hopefully I'm not offending anybody. <laughs> Perhaps even beyond, you know, could we go further? Okay. Um, so warbyparker.com was founded in 2010 in February while the four founders were still in school. And uh, the four guys, Neil, Dave, Andy, and Jeff, came into my office and uh, they wanted to do an independent study, which I really like to do. I should, I should talk to Sam or we should talk to the dean or somebody, but well, I guess this is now going out. So the, the cat's out, I've already said it, so I may as well continue. So independent studies, as a faculty member, you get no credit for doing it. It's not like at UCLA, if you supervise independent studies, you get course credit. Well, you don't. So you're just doing it out of the sort of goodness of your heart, as it, as it were. So the four guys come into my office and they say, you know what, we've got this idea. Uh, we're going to sell glasses on the internet. <laughs> sort of an absurd idea. You know? How could you possibly do that? I mean, I don't wear glasses, but when you want to get glasses, don't you want to try a lot on? And I mean, how are you going to get over that? And so that's Warby Parker was born. Uh, yesterday, if you read the news, they just announced their Series B round of $37 million uh, on top of a seed round in May 2001 and another professional round in October. So this is a company that has $55 million uh, in funding. It's one of the hottest brands, not eyewear companies, that's the difference. They're not an eyewear company, they're a brand. And I'm going to show you how they, they did it through the digital space. Okay, so that's, that's the story of uh, Warby Parker. Um, Pop-up pantry, says so Tom is here. You could get better information from Tom, but again, uh, very, very interesting business. Tom and his partner David, they raised a seed round uh, earlier this year, also announced in TechCrunch of $1.7 million from some very interesting backers, uh, Crosscut and GRP. What Pop-up pantry does is it gives you food for the price of takeout for two people. So say like Laura and I want to have dinner, instead of going to Chili's or TGI Friday's or ordering a Domino's pizza, what we can do is we can get an appetizer, a dessert, and a main course, essentially for the price of takeout that's made by a chef. And it's kind of a two-sided market. If I'm a chef in Los Angeles, I want to expand my reach around the country. Um, this is good for me because it's giving me access to people outside my geographical trading area. If I live in a small town in Iowa, and I'm really into food now, because I watch the Iron Chef and the Food Network, but I literally only have TGI Fridays or Chili's, you know, Tom is, is kind of my savior. So I'll talk a little bit more about Pop-Up Pantry. Uh, Bonobos is actually the oldest of the three, was founded by a uh, Stanford MBA, but there are a bunch of Wharton people who work there. And both Warby Parker and Bonobos, I've done some research on their data. It's a pants company. Have you guys heard of this one? It's also uh, it's apparel, but it's really a brand as much as anything else. I'll show you that in a second. Okay, so those are the three that we're going to take a look at. And let me just um, bring, up, bring up the sites. So actually, you know what? I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll mention what's, what's different, then I'll show you the sites. Um, so what are the digital considerations? when you think about branding now in a digital marketing world. So the thing in the black I've put, because that goes back to the earlier slide, it's digital marketing, but it's still marketing. Okay? Digital marketing won't save you from having a crummy product and bad service and terrible assortment and awful fulfillment. All it will do is just make that obvious to everybody else at a much faster rate of time. Okay? That's all it's going to do for you. So you still have to have the outstanding value proposition and the incredible positioning in order for this to work. But you know what gets layered on top in the digital space is authenticity and transparency to all stakeholders is absolutely critical. 
It's, it's critical for Warby Parker and Pop-Up Pantry and Bonobos in a way that people didn't think about it 20 years ago. Uh, the second thing that's really important here is the personality, not just of the brand, but of the people who work at the company and the kind of humanization that takes place through the use of rich media and so forth. I'm going to use um, Warby Parker to kind of illustrate this, and I'm going to use Pop-Up Pantry to illustrate this. And then the third thing that's really kind of interesting here is kind of the infinite life of some of the digital marketing tools and tactics. And I'll show this when we get to it, but just to preview it, uh, JetBlue did a very interesting thing a few years ago. They had a program called JetBlue Tw uh, Cheeps you know, that they sent out over Twitter, so it's C-H-E-E-P-S. And what this allowed you to do is it allowed you to um, essentially fly anywhere in the US that JetBlue flew for 30 days for about 600 bucks. Okay, it's a pretty good deal. But what's interesting in terms of serendipity, it just so turned out, and I'll show you the link, that there was a gentleman who was raising money for cancer, I think for breast cancer, and he was literally flying to 29 cities in 29 days to raise money, and he turned out to actually take advantage of this deal, which then got picked up by a TV station. You can imagine how that kind of exploded in the blogosphere. Okay? Um, but what's also interesting, too, <laughs> is this negative side, the sort of long tail of reactions. So in the internet space, it's not just about the average, it's about the extremes. So when McDonald's, which I'll show you later on, started the hashtag McD stories on Twitter, hoping that people would say nice things about McDonald's, guess what? They didn't, okay? And that had to be shut down pretty quickly. So those are three things that are very different when you think about branding through digital marketing. So let me show you the site just so that you can get a better sense of it. I'm going to start with Warby Parker. Uh, this is the, the company. So what you do, if you buy a pair of glasses from these guys for $95, they give a pair to somebody else for free uh, around the world. But what's really interesting, I'm going to show you in terms of the, the branding and the transparency, is kind of our story. Okay, so we go on here, and the transparency, and how, how is it that we do it? You know, how is it that we cut out the middleman? Um, how is it that we can sell you a pair of glasses that's just as good as the Armani glasses that you've got on your face that you paid four or $500 for? We can do it for 95 with the lenses in, the prescription, everything else. This is kind of how we go about things. Okay? So there's sort of an interesting transparency and an authenticity there that gets amplified through various kinds of things that Neil and Dave in particular do when they go to India. I'm not going to show you the video in the interest of time. And they're giving glasses to people in New Delhi and so forth. It's a very, very different way of kind of interacting. Um, I'll also show you, before I show you the video, um, the way they kind of do their annual report. So this is something that they put out on Twitter. This is the Warby Parker year in review. And um, if you go down here and you click on social media, it tells you about who was coming to their website and how many posts there were and how many photos got tagged and how many Twitter mentions and how it grew over time, how many likes they got in one day. So this is a very, very different way of branding than what it meant to build a brand you know, 5, 10, or 15 years ago. Okay? Uh, just in the interest of fun, to show you also how they kind of do the signaling about the quality of their product, and they really get the positioning right, I'm going to show you a, a video. I think if, you've, if you haven't seen it, you'll enjoy it. If you've seen it once uh, before, you'll probably still find it funny. So let me pull it up. So here was the problem that I had when they first came into my office, and this is how they solved it. This man needs glasses. He has very high standards and particular tastes. Boutiques are expensive and have left him disappointed. And with discount retailers, the results are unpredictable. So he's trying Warby Parker. The virtual try-on tool gives him recommendations to fit his face. And with the home try-on program, he gets five pairs shipped to his home for free. He can spend quality time with each pair and pick the very best one. The vintage-inspired frames are handsome and well-built. It's very important to find the right frames. And when it happens, he just sends Warby Parker his prescription, and his frames come back, lenses in, for $95. And for every pair they sell, Warby Parker gives a pair to someone in need. He likes that. Now he's got the frames he wants. 
A pair that fits right and looks good. Find your pair at warpyparker.com. And again, what's interesting, just to go back to what Paul said at the start and what Jake said too, this is something that's easily shared, it's seen again and again, it's a creative that's not bounded in terms of the amount of time that you've got and so forth. So that's how those guys have been doing their branding. Um, what I'd like to now show you in terms of brand personality and humanization, <coughs> excuse me, since um, Tom is here in the, uh, the audience, uh, I'm going to show you some interesting things that Pop-Up Pantry is doing. First of all, maybe I'll show you the website. So here is... Uh, Tom, who's here in the audience, sitting over here. So in terms of um, personalization and humanization, you know, if you go through, you learn a little bit about everybody who's kind of running the business. Uh, if you click over the top of the dog, okay, you find out that, um, that Bucky, the dog, if you cancel your order, you get an email from Bucky saying, hey, why did you leave us? What's going on? Okay, so it's a very, very different way of kind of personalizing and selling not just the product, but what's being sold here is the whole team. And for those of us who sort of enjoy and love California, um, if we go in here into About Us, we find that, you know, this is a company that was crafted in California. California is where good food comes from. These are guys who really care about food. They love food. They're going to deliver you food that's going to be good for you, and it's also going to be enjoyable to eat. This was the JetBlue uh, Cheaps promotion. You can see it was incredibly successful in terms of the response. Again, going back to our three pillars, right? The second pillar was all about measurability. They could obviously also experiment with this too. And this is the link to the guy who did the 29 cities in 29 days to raise money for cancer. So this is serendipity helping you out. Um, this is just some of the text of what's going on. Again, it's really personalizing the company because it's allowing for a dialogue and it's allowing for interaction. Um, here's the McD stories. So McDonald's was trying to do the same thing. And, um, you know, I walked into McDonald's. I could smell, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> and actually, this is, <laughs> this is um, Ada McFish, and I vomited one hour later, you know. So <laughs> Um, but this is not to denigrate, you know, large companies, but what's interesting, and again, just in the interest of time, we can't go into all of it, but there have been many attempts by larger, bigger, more established players to kind of get into this new tool, and they've kind of lost their way. Because I think they sort of haven't sat back and thought about, well, who's going to read this, who's going to see it, who's the target customer, segmentation, targeting, and, and positioning, okay? So let us now sort of move on to um, digital considerations for customers. So the number one thing, which is in black, is still the same. This is pre-digital and post-digital. You still have to target attractive customers. Okay, and, uh, you know, Tom, if you catch him afterwards, he'll tell you who he's targeting. You know, Bonobos is targeting sort of the 20 to 40-ish. I have to have the ish since, like, I've got a pair of the pants on. 40-ish okay? uh, year old guy who sort of wants something a little more stylish, et cetera, et cetera. They do a lot of research. They know the guy's favorite movie, not mine, but it's a good one, is Shawshank Redemption and all of this kind of stuff. So they really know who it is that they're going after. Um, the three things that are kind of really interesting, that are new, it takes a monologue and it turns it into a conversation and a conversation among multiple people. Um, I'm going to show this here with, again, Pop-Up Pantry. The other thing that we saw with both the Coke video uh, and also the McD stories and so forth is you get amplification through virtual world and real world synergy. So what does that mean? Don't forget about the real world because if you're doing cool stuff in the real world, the virtual world is just unbelievable in terms of exploding that and giving it exponential exposure and exponential growth. And then finally down here, this idea of leveraging the long tail of customers. So as I mentioned earlier, the best source of new customers for an e-commerce business often, or for any business, is the existing customers because they know um, who's out there that's like them that's going to be valuable. So I'll give you two good examples. One's diapers.com. When we looked at diapers.com, uh, the data told us about 8 to 10 percent of people would refer somebody else. Okay, so I refer Jake, Jake refers somebody else, I get a $1 credit towards buying more diapers. So that happens with a probability of about 8 percent. But guess what? It turns out that Jake, if he came in through that channel, number one, has a higher customer lifetime value than somebody randomly who came in through search or some other method. Number two, so that's kind of a selection issue. So the selection's working in your favor. The customer finds the next good customer. The second thing that's really interesting is the treatment effect. The customer who becomes a customer because of that kind of interaction is more apt to then sort of pay it forward, and it goes up to about 2x, about 15%. Uh, one of my other colleagues at Wharton, Christoph Vandenbolt, that some of you guys might have had, uh, also showed with a European bank, same kind of thing, customers coming in through that channel 
uh, are ultimately more valuable customers coming in through offline word of mouth. So trying to find for your business who these super customers are is a really critical thing to understand and, and to exploit. Yeah, question. How long does that probability keep going up? Ah, that's a good question. Um, in the instance that we looked at, um, it was really just the first transition. So, you know, if you really played it out. Uh, but the, the other piece of data that went along with that, if you kind of sliced off the top. So I'll, I'll give you the stats to just think about the average and the, um, the extreme. So on average, one diapers.com customer was recruiting about four other ones on average. But so that means out of about 8,000 customers brought in 32. But if you slice that again, you looked at the top 100, they brought in almost half, 15,000. So there's incredible, you know, there's incredibly enthusiastic people out there who can do unbelievable things for you if you can motivate them and find out who they are. Okay. Yeah, question. Um, so this is really interesting. So the um, question was, what was their motivation? So sometimes we motivate people through financial incentives, but I think one of the most interesting motivations is just purely intrinsic as opposed to extrinsic. They just felt so good about the product or service. And if you're really doing a great job, uh, there will be people who will love pop-up pantry so much they'll tell everybody. There will be people who love Warby Parker so much they'll post photographs of themselves wearing the glasses in some random city. And you know, So intrinsic motivation, I think, is really, really important. Understanding how to give people almost nothing monetarily. This is a very Wharton-esque. You know, give, give them almost nothing, but it feels really good. So Laura and I were having a conversation. <laughs> I keep forgetting, you know, this is getting recorded, but okay. So um, Laura and I were discussing earlier, you know, different airlines. It's interesting that Asian airlines and Air New Zealand and so forth tend to take more of a service position, whereas US airlines, we all know, take more of a price-based position. So she said she was flying on Singapore Airlines. Just the fact that the scent that they had in the bathroom doesn't cost much, and the hand cream, but it just makes you feel so much better about that service, even though the cost is, is relatively minuscule. Okay. So let me show you this amplification. Um, I mentioned the Warby Parker example with the glasses, but let me show you one from, um, from Tom. Pop-Up Pantry is a small company, but Pop-Up Pantry was able to get master... Anyone watch MasterChef? So here you're doing amplification. You're teaming with real-world, traditional TV, big media advertising. And what you're doing, and I'll, I'll show Tom, uh, is you're allowing people actually to order the dinners of the winners that were announced last night on TV uh, through Pop-Up Pantry. So, just for fun, let's go over here and let's take a quick look. When you watch the show MasterChef, don't you wish you could just reach inside the TV and dish yourself up a plate of food? Well, we've got the next best thing. The meals on tonight's season finale can get delivered straight to your doorstep. We've got Tom Balamacy here from Pop-Up Pantry. Tom, good to see you. Good morning, Jessica. Now, does Gordon Ramsay ring the doorbell and ta-da? <laughs> we wish. He might, he might yell at you if he does. Exactly. <laughs> okay, this is a cool idea because right now you're doing a little partnership with MasterChef, which mm -hmm. is a great idea, but it exists 24 hours 24 a day, every day of the week. But how does this work? We'll start with the box. Yeah, this you just nice start little box. popuppantry.com. Yeah. Sign up for free, browse. If you see something you like, you order a dinner from us and we ship it to you in an insulated box right to your door, to your home or office. So it's perfect for busy moms, working people, people staying at home and just don't have time. We'll give you two printed menus, just like a restaurant. Yeah. And super simple, easy to follow preparation tips that anyone can follow. That is a really great idea. Now you're saying this is the price of price maybe of a takeout. takeout. Like a nice takeout. So basically what you'd pay for an entree in, in a nice restaurant, yeah. you're going to get a full three-course dinner that serves two people that's ready in a half an hour or less. That's a, now we can't tell you what the final meal is going to be on MasterChef because it airs tonight. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that you guys offer, sure. we'll show you what's on the table yeah, here. Yeah, so each dinner includes an appetizer, mm -hmm. a main, sides and dessert. And here are a few examples. This yeah. is our Portobello Wellington, a delicious, delicious good. vegetarian option where you won't miss the meat at all. Now, when it comes to us in the box, would we have to maybe stick that in the oven and yeah. heat it up for a Yeah, if you can bake a frozen pizza or you can boil water, you can do this. <laughs> it is foolproof for You anyone. give us hope, Tom. Yeah. Blueberry tart, fresh California blueberries here. And, and that looks really nice. Yeah, because, nice crust. Uh, you know what some people are probably thinking? When it gets to you in the box, it's going to be a mess. It's no. not going to look as pretty as it does right here. We really take pride in how we pack it and really give you a gift every month from Pop-Up Pantry. A gift of And food. it's really just easy to do. This is our mojito Cuban chicken. It's mm. got a mango mojito salsa over black bean rice. Really flavorful, comforting dish yeah. with a little exotic twist. 
Now, let's say somebody tonight goes, you know what, I'd love to have a meal this evening. Do you have to do it the day before? Can you do it the night of? You can keep it in the freezer for as long as you want, and okay. it's ready for in a half an hour from frozen. If you mm -hmm. thaw it the night before, it'll be ready in 15 minutes or less. So here's one of the way to do it. Like, for instance, this is... This is the warm asparagus salad. Okay. You okay, I'm going to uh, stop uh, embarrassing uh, Tom. I didn't mention, didn't mention your uh, Wharton affiliation there. We should have got that in, you know, so anyway. <laughs> All right, so you know, I encourage you to go and, um, and take another look. So what's interesting there is that's obviously being amplified for pop-up pantry using, of course, they're tweeting and they're doing all kinds of other things with digital media, but also now using real media to get that amplification and uh, the validation through, through chefs and everything else. Um, what I want to do is just in the last two minutes, I'll just quickly mention a book that I'm currently writing. I guess I didn't get time to talk about this particular part because I do want us to have a chance to interact together and to ask uh, Q&A. So the sub blurb is a little bit uh, long, but uh, there's a paper that we just published. Uh, Len Lodish, many of you may have had Len as a colleague, a fantastic Wharton person for many, many years, started many companies, a real entrepreneur, but also a really top quality uh, academic. And uh, we published an article in the MIT Sloan Management Review. So this book, hopefully I'll have finished in a couple of months. But um, what we found looking at e-commerce in particular is sort of five principles of how the physical world was really driving what was going on in the virtual world for uh, diapers.com, netgrocer.com, Bonobos, and Warby Parker. Those were the four companies we looked at. So the way people buy is not, so the way people shop, the way they search, and the way they buy is not uniformly distributed across the United States. It's not proportional to the population either. There are real quirks to do with location. So your offline shopping costs. If you live a long way from a restaurant, you're more likely to use pop-up pantry. If you live in a state, that, does, that charges tax on diapers, you're much more likely to buy them from diapers.com. If you live in a very densely populated environment, you're more likely to share word of mouth. These are very, very systematic and robust effects. Um, sales evolution tends to be very structured and pre predictable. It starts in certain hotspots, LA, San Diego, San Francisco, and it spreads in those hotspots. And then it kind of jumps to locations that are further apart, but they share interesting similarities. They may be physically far apart, but they may be demographically very similar. So if you've heard of the long tail, I'm sure many of you probably read Chris Anderson's book, there's a long tail here uh, in terms of sales evolution, point three, that's sort of sales evolution over location. So to do really well in e-commerce, whether you're selling, whether you're searching, whether you're, um, you're shopping, I guess whether you're selling or, or you're having people search, uh, it's not just about the big blockbuster locations, it's about that incredible tail of stuff way out ones and twos is very, very important. Um, the fourth point we kind of pointed out in this paper, it's going, to, it's going to be in the MIT Sloan Management Review, so you can get it off my website if you're interested, is isolated people are really worth pursuing, okay? So isolated people are kind of interesting. We call them in the paper preference minorities. And Tom and I had an interesting discussion about this almost two years ago. So a preference minority is like me in Philadelphia. Every time I go to that supermarket, I look for the Vegemite that's never there, okay? <laughs> Why is there no Vegemite? Because none of you guys want Vegemite, okay? So the guy running the supermarket is not going to put it on the shelf because it's not going to move quickly enough. So you find people who are underserved because they're different from the people around them in terms of their tastes. This was a hugely important sort of insight we had for diapers.com. 50% higher sales in locations where people with kids are a low proportion of the total population. Um, related to this, one other thing that we did recently with Bonobos and I'll, I'll do a quick Q&A, is um, for their product, we looked at the diffusion of the pants in different neighborhoods around the U.S., and I got some data from a fellow who was one of President Obama's uh, advisors. Uh, this guy, his name is escaping me now, but he wrote the book America is Bowling Alone, about the decline and fall of, uh, sorry, the rise and decline of social capital in America. This idea that people don't congregate as much anymore, don't go to the tennis club, don't, play ch don't go to church, et cetera, et cetera. So he went out and he measured social capital with 30,000 people and 1,000 zip codes. He asked them, do you trust your neighbors? Do you like your neighbors? Do you interact with them? And so on. And what we found in locations that had more trust and more interaction, sales of bonobos pants diffused more quickly. But we wanted to make that useful to the managers because not everyone can get this data from the Kennedy School. Uh, and the guy's name is uh, Robert Putnam. It's a very interesting book. So we wanted to come up with a proxy for males 25 to 40 interacting and hanging out wearing socially visible products. What might be an interesting proxy for that? Or what would be a proxy in a zip code for sort of social capital, uh, but this would be for males who are 25 to 40 going out wearing pants. 
I mean, what, what, what would be a potential... Pro Ask Joshua Leishberg and he, he, he got it. Uh, yeah, weddings, okay, people have to dress up, okay. We could look at weddings. So you know what we did? We just looked at the number of bars and liquor stores per capita, per zip code, that's actually positively correlated at about 0.4 and it explains the same thing. So the implication for bonobos would be if you targeted those locations and you wanted to throw in an extra pair of pants, sales would be higher. Um, the fifth thing is also, if you think about search advertising, it's the same. Different locations require different customer acquisition strategies. In some locations, you're better off using word of mouth. In other locations, you're better off doing Google search. And there's real systematic differences across locations, even in terms of whether you should use television or print advertising or anything else. Okay. Um, I might put this up while we're doing Q&A. Um, this is since it's election year, this is one thing I just wanted to end, it on, end on for fun, uh, is looking at the social media kind of savvy of uh, the two candidates who are running for president, who has more likes, who has more Facebook followers, who does more tweets, okay? And uh, when I was giving a talk, we have a sister school, the Huntsman School at Utah State. I met a very interesting fellow who's going to come and talk in my class, uh, John Johnson, who's a professor there. He and one of his students have started a company called Politic IT. So if you're interested in digital marketing just from a uh, substantive point of view, I think you'll find this interesting. You remember exit polling? You know, you'd go and take a vote, they ask you on the way out, who'd you vote for, Obama or Romney? And that was pretty predictive. Then you remember the Iowa Stock Exchange. You could buy and sell shares in George Bush and John Kerry, and that turned out to be a better predictor than exit polls. Of course, at Wharton, we all know why, because when I'm buying a stock in Bush or selling it, I'm taking into account not only my own preference, but what I think you guys are all thinking. So it leads to a better prediction. What these guys do is they troll the social space and the digital space, and they come up with predictions. And they were incredibly successful in small scale in Utah. Now they've got some national traction, and he's going to come to my class. I'll get it videoed if you're interesting, interested. Um, and it's going to be on November the 5th, the day before the presidential election. So he's going to talk about the algorithm that he uses to predict outcomes. OK. So we've got to the end. I think we're OK in terms of time. Um, I'll give a few summary points, but I really wanted to now just turn it over to you guys. Hopefully there were some principles there. Again, we couldn't really get into the minutiae of all of the different ways we can execute. But I think to step back and think about, you know, what are the principles that we need to build a brand and to acquire customers, and how are they similar and also different in this new environment? Okay, so thanks, thanks very much, and let's do some Q&A. Please, yeah. So uh, just looking at uh, from The Economist, they, uh, online they did a uh, representation of a heat map represented by Amazon.com talking about the purchase of uh, red books and blue books mm -hmm. and the likely implications to the, uh, the election. Program. Interesting. And so the country was mostly, through the Amazon channel, red, red states, red books, red, uh, uh, I guess, Republican, uh, I think what's interesting about that is that people, so something called um, T Tebow sorting, named after a famous guy, Tebow Real Estate. Uh, huh? Oh, no, not, oh, yeah. <laughs> No, this is this is T I E B O U T, not T E B O W. Okay, I mean, even my even my little nephew in New Zealand knows like who Tim Tebow is. But okay, <laughs> I thought he was going to actually get some time on the field the other day, but he didn't. That's a different story. But no, I think because people so t Tebow or Tybell sorting is the idea that people sort themselves into neighborhoods or locations that offer stuff that they want, including the kinds of people that they want to live amongst. And so it's not surprising to me that when you can somehow match that by looking at what's bought in different locations, that actually could be very predictive of other behavior. Um, and given the scale of Amazon, it would be interesting to put that to the test against politic IT or against exit polling or something else. But I, I think if you think of things in a regression sense, there would be some real explanatory power, knowing what books were bought in what location. Ab absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. Question, please. Hey, David. Yeah. Uh, so the three products or the three companies you covered are physical products. Yes. So how do you think differently about digital experiences? Gmail, for instance, mm -hmm. was in beta for three years, even though it had millions and tens of millions of users. So uh, do digital companies have an opportunity to maybe explore a sixth principle? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's uh, my, my experience from a research point of view has been more with physical products. I think I would say, honestly, I know a little more about what's going on with physical goods versus virtual goods. 
Um, when I was on sabbatical, I was spending a little time with some of my colleagues at Google, and um, they also see, though, very systematic patterns in usage of different products and searching, all kinds of stuff that varies a lot by location. Uh, I can't remember the exact finding, but I think you'd see the same thing there, that even for virtual goods, there's going to be a physical component to, to usage. I don't know if anyone else in the audience has any, any data on that. I know it's not a very satisfactory answer, but I'll think on it, and we can continue the, the dialogue. Any, any observations on that? Virtual goods? Yeah, please. 50 Shades of Grey, statistics came out that of the 30 million copies that were sold in the second quarter, half of them were e-books. Interesting. Okay. So and was there any systematic patent to where they were sold? Is it, I guess this they is a virtual good? systematic patent, patent at all, but they said that nationwide that 50% of that 30 million were e-books. Huh. So in terms of migration to the e-universe versus the physical book in hand, it's very indicative of what's going on. Actually, it's, I actually really like the point because uh, one of the most interesting things that's happening these days right, is the, trans the transfer of tangible goods into intangible goods. Same, so, thing, with, same thing with DVDs. Yep. And the mm -hmm. same thing with the moving the cloud of virtually all the video games. Yep. The video games are you downloading it as a code rather than taking the physical goods, which is taking a real toll on the video game makers as well as the DVD sure. makers. Sure, or even iTunes, right? Instead of having iTunes on my iPhone, I just use Spotify. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff about things that are basically used to be physical, like money. What happens to money when you turn it into a credit card? Or what happens to money when it becomes PayPal? You know, it's really kind of interesting when physical goes, not food can't go uh, f virtual yet, but yeah. Yeah, so the reason I asked the question is because uh, I work in a video game company, so all of our goods are, are digital, and 80% yeah. of our players actually refer, came from friends who referred them. Um, and there's a high correlation between physical location and uh, referral rate. Really? Very yeah. interesting. I, I'd love to talk more about that. I, th I think it's, uh, you know, and actually what got me mo motivated into this from a research point of view, you know, academic research and now into, into writing this book, is we all hear the world is flat, and it kind of is flat, but it's also lumpy, right? Um, and the way these activities get distributed across the space is not proportional necessarily to things like population, but it has real structure, and that structure is very, very interesting. Yeah, good. Any other uh, comments, please? Yeah. Have you done any work on B2B and social media, or are there some references? Yeah, great question. So B2B and social media. So it turns out, this is the great thing about being at Wharton, there's just so many people running around. Uh, we had a visiting scholar from Japan who was working for NEC Japan, and she wrote a huge monograph on what's going on in B2B and social media, how companies like IBM you know, are using Twitter and so forth. So um, I can certainly get access to that if you're interested. My, uh, well, my email is, um, is on the front slide. It's just David B at Wharton. Uh, but yeah, social media, I think, is huge in the B2B space. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments? Please, yeah. Are there any insights for those large companies that are finding it so tricky to enter the social world? So I think part of it actually comes down to uh, comes down to people that you just have to have, you know, so when I think about, for example, I'm using now in my course something called coursekit.com. It's now law.com. It was in The Economist the other week. It's one of our Wharton undergrad students, Joe Cohen. Guy's only about 21. Uh, but he was a guy who sort of sat through, you guys probably have Web Cafe or Blackboard or some other clunky, terrible thing. So he's a kid who sort of grew up in the Facebook generation, like, this sucks, this is awful. So he raised $6 million and he's building his own um, alternative. So I think, <laughs> where was I going with the answer? Sorry, I got up at 1.30 this morning. Sorry, repeat the last part of the question. <laughs> oh, yeah, big, so big companies, I think it's critical, right? We started with the Coke ad. Uh, big companies, the good thing about big companies is they have resources. The bad thing is that it's kind of used to the old way of doing things. And so those insights, like Joe Cohen's insight, probably would not have come from whoever was running Blackboard, even though Blackboard's a very, very valuable company. So I think a lot of it's just getting the infusion of the young people coming through. It's picking up some of the sort of really niche and interesting players in the digital marketing toolkit space who really know how to do it. Uh, but the, yeah, and I think even traditional agencies and so forth struggle with, with execution as well. Yep, please. Uh, one of the what you just said made me think of something in terms of, um, of big companies as they move into this space. There's so much needed in terms of resource. When you set up a blog or you set up any kind of interactive um, medium, how do, you, how do companies deal with that? What yeah. So again, I think you know, having dedicated teams and trying things out on a small scale. So one of our principles here was experimentation. 
So just seeing what's possible and what, what works. Um, it was buried a little bit in the slides, but for JetBlue, having a team of 10 people and all they did was tweet and interact with customers was unbelievably successful. I think the statistic there was 10 million um, people extra coming to the website, you know, 700% extra kind of conversion, and it was because they had a dedicated group of people who were just focused on that tool for a specific purpose. So I think that, that's, that's critical, that's critical. Yeah, please. Does that mean the return on investment for marketing on social media just will always now supersede that of traditional? Is that that's where a, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck and over time the allocation just won't be there? For that's a great anymore? question. It's re a really interesting question. So is everyone gonna move away from traditional and go purely into digital and social? So I think two, two things there. Number one, the biggest advantage of digital and social is it's inherently measurable. That's why Google makes a lot of money. But you could argue that what they measure really, or not just them, is really just the last piece. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that I told you about you know, something tonight and you do it three months down the road and Google gets uh, credit for the click. Um, so the biggest thing with that kind of medium is it's measurable, so you should know whether it's working or not. I don't think the other media are becoming redundant though. Interestingly, I don't have the stats, somebody told me that I think in 2012, TV advertising actually is going up. So the allocation is not all shifting away. We saw with uh, diapers.com, the magazine advertising through Parenting Magazine was a crucial customer acquisition tool, particularly in the middle part of the, the country. So I think they'll remain, but there'll be more pressure on them to be properly measurable in the way that the digital stuff already, at least in part, is, is measurable. So, uh, it's, it's, yeah. So then like companies like Facebook, I mean, they're going through their own problems right now, but yes. they can provide you such targeted information on their users and subscribers relative to somebody like Google. The value that they bring to you intrinsically should be a higher value to someone who wants to use that targeted marketing. Yeah, the only thing though, it depends on what outcome you're measuring, right? So if you think about, you know, standard kind of market research, there's two outcomes that we could measure. We could measure behavioral outcomes, like clicks, purchases, likes, tweets, or what. but we could also measure attitudinal outcomes. Maybe now I feel differently about the brand. I tell somebody else, there's sort of league and lag effects too. Things don't always happen in the moment. Sometimes they percolate for time. So I think there's a lot of stuff that's really valuable, like even a TV ad, uh, that somehow is not fully getting the credit that it probably deserves. Uh, I, I actually yeah. <laughs> wanted to address that. Yes, good, um, good. I presented a paper at the Wharton Future of Advertising con conference back in Fantastic. end of May, beginning of June. Uh, I work for a company that does demand analytics, and we do the, the all of the marketing. And what we found in our study is that you need the traditional offline marketing and other forms of marketing to spark what's happening online, and then it amplifies it. So it's not the last click, it's not the last action, it's understanding the whole ecosystem of how people interact with the brand and interact with the message, interact with the product, and then allocating and attributing that value. So we're seeing that even print is still, I mean, hmm. a smaller part of the mix, but print still works. So I would say, no, that's not yeah. the case. Great, Thank this is a great thing about being part of the Wharton community, right? There's always somebody who knows what the answer is, so that's good. Yeah, please. Well, another example of an area you really didn't speak to in media is I regularly, my biggest business is in radio yep. promotions. Mm -hmm. And radio, even though when we speak to people, they say, well, everything's moving to the online social media. We can't even talk to you. The fact is, of all the statistics, 95% of the American marketplace still listens to radio. Mm -hmm. And more mm -hmm. often than not, they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Yep. Yep. And when we say, oh, no, no, everything's social media. The fact is that the bulk of Americans, not yep. just the, the early the early testers of things, it's people are following radio. More and more radio outlets are using social media, mm -hmm. come to our website, come to our Facebook page and the like. But the challenge I have is telling them, well, radio is still very strong and important. And you didn't even mention radio today. I mean, in terms of newspapers, mm -hmm. we know that's taking a, a strong mm -hmm. dive. But in terms of radio, it's still a vibrant piece. And people say, well, everything's moving over to Pandora. Everything's going to XM Sirius. There's, even Apple's coming out with radio. The fact is that those total account for 4% of the total of the radio audience, mm -hmm. which is still pretty big and vibrant. But most people don't even listen or think about that. Yeah, they no, I, I, think, I think it's a great point, right? As we tend to get sort of caught up in the euphoria of all this new stuff, and if, but if you go back to segmentation, targeting, positioning, one of my friends, um, if you ever had a class with Eric Bradlow, he's a very funny guy, great Wharton professor. His cousin uh, has a company, he's the Mattress Doctor. He has half, if you need a good bed, go to the Mattress Doctor, mattressdoctor.com. 
<laughs> and his most, <laughs> his most effective marketing tactic that he used in Florida, Miami and Tampa and other cities was advertising on the radio during sports programs to guys so that the guy could actually show that he was paying attention to his wife or his partner that he'd get to this new bed. Uh, and it was incredibly effective for him. So I think if you understand who your customer is, then you understand what the right tool is. And if you put the tool before understanding who it is that you're going after, you, you're going to come to the wrong. Another great example. Yes. Yeah. just a fabulous example. Most people remember a number of years ago, Richard Simmons. Yep. And he was, he was on, a, on a radio show talking about how successful he was, and someone was complaining that they couldn't turn on television without seeing him in the middle of the night. He said the reason he wound up in television in the middle of the night because it was the cheapest available time, or he could do it for a trade convention. But the important part to him is his niche market was fat people who were eating in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you mind if I use that example in my class? I love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah, great. All right. I think we'll take, are we okay on time? We'll take another couple. Okay. Well, please. Yeah, there's a couple of gentlemen. Yeah, please. Yeah, Raj. Yeah. And then we'll take the gentleman in the front too. So, Raj, so yeah. um, if you're selling to a B2B um, and your clients are secretive about what they do, like, hedge funds, for example, mm -hmm. we want to sell to them. We know they talk somehow, somewhere, and they refer each other, but we just cannot acknowledge that they do so. It's very hard for us to apply the inborn marketing techniques to actually you know, share that experience they are getting, and we are having a hard time <coughs> connecting mm. the digital world to the real world, and so we are forced to shell our inborn marketing plans to say, go direct sales. So we have to seed them to a point before we can get, get that experience, uh, you know, for them to talk about it themselves. So the question huh. is, is there a threshold that you have to cross for the digital world to come alive? Is that in the, in the B2B context? Okay, let me think. This is similar to the question that the gentleman at the front asked too. So just so you know, so Raj and I had a conversation earlier um, before we started. So Raj runs and founded a company called AlphaSense that provides text-based information on uh, filings, security filings and so forth to buy-side analysts to kind of pour through that. They can search it and they can you know, maybe make some additional money for their funds and so on. So, um, yeah, to the extent that there's a closed community that people are not allowing themselves to be tracked, the trick there is to try and think about some proxy uh, for who they are and who they're interacting with, even if they're sort of shielding themselves in a professional sense. I'd have to think about it more, but there may be some, some way around that. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get you at the end. Okay, thanks, Raj. One, one more question from the, the gentleman. It's just a comment. I yeah read an article in The Economist recently that supports all the analog advertising advocates mm -hmm. in the room, that digital and online is only about 20 to 25 percent, I believe, of all gross advertising revenue in America right now. Yeah, so that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think to what's more exciting, if I go back and then we'll, we'll call it quits so you guys can grab a drink and we can do a little bit of mingling, um, to what Jake said earlier on about this new medium allowing for um, communication and interaction, interacting among individuals and sort of giving a longer life to the marketing that you do. Because it sits there, right, like that Coke ad that I showed, that's now at 4.9, last time it was at 3.5. So I think even if there's less media g money going into it, the effect that it may ultimately have could be amplified through this kind of social process that's, that's happening. So guys, so thank you very much for coming out on a, uh, on a Tuesday night. Much appreciated. Good to see you. Thank you.